Today I want to talk to you about modeling molecules. So we've talked about ways to model molecules in two-dimensional space, so on a piece of paper. And we talked about the Lewis dot model. So I want to talk about how we can go from that two-dimensional Lewis dot model to a three-dimensional representation of a molecule. And to do that we use a model called VESPER. And it stands for valence shell, electron pair, repulsion. So valence shell, electron pair, repulsion, VESPER. Now valence shell, remember, are the outermost highest energy electrons. So these are the ones that are involved in bonding, so they're the ones that we care about. Electron pair here refers to either a shared pair of electrons, like a covalent bond, or a lone pair, which is a unshared pair. Uh, it's already paired up, so we don't have to pair it up with anything, so that lone pair of electrons. Either one of those can count as an electron pair. And then repulsion just refers to the fact that we're talking about a bunch of electrons here, and these electrons are negatively charged, and like charges are naturally going to repel each other. So in this model, the valence shells, the highest energy electrons, form these pairs, either as a bond, as a shared pair, or multiple shared pairs, or as lone pairs, where they're not shared with another element. And then these pairs, because of their charges, are going to want to naturally repel each other. And what this model says is that, in general, we like to bond in order to have a full valence, right? That's the octet rule. But within an overall structure, matter wants to be as dispersed as possible. So the valence shell electrons, it's an advantageous thing for them to be shared. So if we have something like methane, for instance, CH4, then we said that because of where carbon is on the periodic table, which is column 14 or 4a, it likes to share a pair of electrons with each of my hydrogens here, because each of my hydrogens is bringing in one. And now each of my hydrogens has a full valence because hydrogen only wants two. It's one of the exceptions to the octet rule where eight is not its magic number. And then carbon, because it's shared pairs here, has one, two, four, six, eight valence electrons. So our Lewis dot structure looks like this, where we have kind of a hydrogen off of each of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. So that's our Lewis dot. So we're going from this kind of two-dimensional model to now something that we're making four dimensions, or three dimensions. <laughs> well, let's not go into four dimensions yet. <laughs> okay, so here's our Lewis dot model. If we were to look at this, these hydrogens are as spread out as I can possibly make them on a two-dimensional surface. But it looks like, because of the way that I've drawn this, and because this is the way that they're the most spread out, that I basically have a right angle here. This looks like 90 degrees. Right, a right angle is 90 degrees. So this looks like a 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle, 90 degree, 90 degree. It basically looks like a plus sign, right? So this would be the way that we would expect it to be unless we could bring it into three dimensions somehow. And the way that we bring it into three dimensions is using Vesper. And Vesper says when you have four things around a central atom, four electron pairs around a central atom, that it forms what is called a tetrahedron. Sometimes you'll also see these as electron groups. And these electron pairs or electron groups refer to, again, either a covalent bond so a shared pair or shared pairs, and, or a lone pair. So if we have four electron pairs or four electron groups around a central atom, and in this case our central atom is carbon, 
the central atom is always the one that wants to make the most bonds given the components. So carbon has four valence electrons, it wants to make four bonds. Each of the hydrogens only wants to make one. So the one that's going to be at the center is the one that wants to make the most bonds, which kind of is intuitive. So when you have four electron groups around a central atom, we say that it has tetrahedral geometry. And our prefix tetra is referring to four, right? This is our four prefix, tetrahedral, and hedra is just a shape usually. So the geometry that we have means that I have kind of a four-sided shape. And the way that this tetrahedral geometry looks is like this. So here's our tetrahedral, let's rewrite this. So I take my carbon, so I've gone from my Lewis dot structure, which looks like this in 2D, and now using Vesper, Vesper says that I have this tetrahedral geometry. So I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna draw it where it looks something like this. So here's my model here of my tetrahedron. And you can see that when you look at this thing, I'm gonna kind of move it around in three dimensions here. You can see that these angles are all more obtuse than 90, right? If I focus on that angle right there, kind of the hydrogen that's in my hand, the carbon, which is the black at the center, and the one that's towards the top of your screen, that angle is larger than 90 degrees. So these atoms have been able to spread out more than the 90 degrees that I could have seen on my two-dimensional structure there. Okay, so here's my tetrahedron. Now the way that I can draw this on a two-dimensional surface is like this. This is the convention that we use. So we have our central atom here. We have one of the hydrogens, two of the hydrogens that are in the plane of the page that I'm drawing on. And I represent the ones that are in the plane with just a normal hyphen. Okay, so this is just a normal straight line. Now the one that's coming out at me, I represent with a big blocky triangle. Right, note that it's getting larger as it's coming towards me. So this one's coming out of the page towards you. And then I'll draw a triangle that's getting smaller, which means that it's going back into the page or into the table or whatever it is that we're drawing on here. So the way that I'm looking at this then is like this, where this is my carbon, carbon, hydrogen, and my hydrogen here. These are both in the plane of the page, both in the plane of the page. This one then you can see is coming out at you. This one's coming out. The blocky triangle is getting larger. And then the one that I'm holding on to there is back behind the plane of the board or behind the plane of the page. So this is the way that I've drawn my tetrahedron. Now it's sometimes hard to see. I mean, this is why we use a combination of models as well as drawings here. And if you kind of draw in your, your lines, to show what the overall shape looks like, you can kind of see that it's this four-sided pyramid structure. Or my students will sometimes describe it as a tripod with an antenna on the top. <laughs> and that's kind of your tetrahedron, okay? So that's my tetrahedral structure. That's four electron pairs around a central atom. Now we can also have structures that have four electron groups or four electron pairs around a central atom, but not all of them are covalent bonds. Not all of them are atoms. And so an example of this would be like ammonia. So ammonia is NH3. When I put together the Lewis dot structure for it, and if you have questions on how to do this, there is another video on just Lewis dot structures. I find that nitrogen is gonna be at the center. It wants to make three bonds and it has one lone pair, which I've represented here with my pair of atom, or my pair of electrons, pardon, that have this kind of bubble around it. So I now have still four electron groups, four electron pairs, but in this case, three of them are atoms and one of them is a lone pair. Now this is different than our, um, than our methane up above because our methane up above had four electron pairs, but all four of them were atoms. So it was just easy to say, okay, well that tetrahedral geometry means that I have a tetrahedron, right? It's the same shape as the overall geometry. Now, if I have four electron pairs, this still means that I have tetrahedral geometry, 
But because one of them isn't an atom, because I have this one lone pair here, it means that my shape now is not a tetrahedron. So my shape up here is a tetrahedron. But this one is gonna have tetrahedral geometry, but is not a tetrahedron. So I know that that's a little bit confusing, but hopefully this will help to clarify. If I draw this shape using those conventions I just mentioned here, where I have my central atom, I'm gonna put my lone pair at the top and my hydrogen here. These guys again are in the plane of the page. Then I have one hydrogen that's coming out at me with my big blocky triangle, and one that's going back into the page. Okay, so my tetrahedron schematic is always gonna be the same. Two things in the plane of the page that you're drawing on, one coming out at you, one going away from you. So it's the same structure, it's the same idea, but now I just don't have that extra atom on top. So instead, it's gonna look something like this. Okay, where I have the lone pair that's sort of represented by this flag up here. This flag isn't something that we would actually see if we were looking at this molecule, though it's hard to talk about seeing molecules, right? But um, for all intents and purposes, we don't see the electrons on a molecule um, when we're visualizing their 3D structures, but they still take up the same amount of space and actually a little bit more space than an atom would in the same position. So what you're looking at here in the three-dimensional convention is this shape where the lone pair here and the hydrogen are in the plane of the page, lone pair and hydrogen. Okay, so that's these guys. And then this one's coming out at us, right? It's getting larger, just like this one. And this one's going back into the page. So the one that I'm holding is behind the plane of the overall, uh, if I'm cutting my plane through here, this is where I'm drawing it. Then this would be my overall structure. Now you can see that Without that top atom, I don't quite have my four-sided pyramid anymore, right? I have kind of the same base part to it, and I still have the base of my tetrahedron, but it's not quite uh, the same shape. So I have a different way of uh, describing this shape. I still have tetrahedral geometry because I have four things around a central atom, but now the name of the shape of this thing is a trigonal pyramid. or triangular pyramid. You'll also see it as triangular pyramid. So you have this kind of three-sided pyramid referring to the fact that you have three atoms and one lone pair and it's the base of your tetrahedron which is still a vaguely pyramidal type shape. So if I kind of combine my atoms here and look at the overall shape of this thing, it is a pyramid, it's just not quite the tetrahedron kind of shape, even though the overall structure has tetrahedral geometry. Okay, so there's kind of a distinction to be made between the geometry of a structure and what the final shape is. The shape is totally dependent on the number of atoms that it's connected to. The geometry is dependent on the number of electron groups or electron pairs. Now we can see this further with something like water. Water has two hydrogens attached to an oxygen. So the Lewis dot structure for water looks like this, where I have two lone pairs on my oxygen. Kind of looks like Mickey Mouse. There's my water molecule. So if I was to take my structure for ammonia and replace one of the atoms here with a lone pair, then now I have my two lone pairs and my two atoms. You can see that I still have four electron groups around my central atom. My central atom in this case is oxygen. So when I draw this thing like a tetrahedron, because it's got four electron pairs, which means that it has tetrahedral geometry, then it's gonna look something like this. Here's my oxygen. This one's in the plane. This one's in the plane. This hydrogen's maybe coming out at you, and then this lone pair is kind of going back into the plane of the board, or the plane of my page here. So if I was kind of looking at the way that I've drawn this, then I've drawn it basically like this, where I have the lone pair here, and then this hydrogen in the same plane, so the same flat surface. This one's coming out at you, this one's coming out at you, 
and you can't really see my other one, but the other uh, lone pair is back here behind, going back into the page, okay? So when you look at the overall structure then, if I get rid of these lone pairs, because we wouldn't see them anyway on a normal molecule of water, I get something that looks like this. So I have four electron groups, it causes these things to bend a little bit out of the plane, and so with two atoms and two lone pairs, we get a structure that is technically called a bent molecule, okay? So that's my water. So within four electron pairs, I have three choices. I can have either a tetrahedron, which is all four of them atoms. I can have my trigonal pyramid, which if I put my atom back here on my ammonia, has the one lone pair and just the base of my tetrahedron. And then I also have this bent molecule that is just kind of two legs of that same pyramid. Okay, so on all of them they have the exact same geometry. It's just different, their overall shape at the end is different depending on how many of those electron pairs, they all have four, but how many of those four electron pairs are atoms. Okay, so that's tetrahedral geometry. Now we can also have other types of geometry. If I have three electron groups around a central atom, or three electron pairs around a central atom, we say that the overall geometry is trigonal planar. So trigonal planar geometry. And I've seen it both ways. Trigonal planar and trigonal planar are Okay, trigonal planar geometry. So in the same way, if I have three electron groups, regardless of how many are atoms or lone pairs, then I'm gonna have a trigonal planar type um, association. And again, Vesper says the reason that we make these geometries is to try to spread out as much as physically possible. And so an example of that would be something like this. This is boron trihydride. And boron is one of our metalloids or semi-metals. And if I draw the Lewis dot structure for boron, you can see that boron only has three valence electrons. And so when I share those three valence electrons with three hydrogens, I don't end up with a full octet, right? I only have six valence electrons around the boron. And so this is one of the exceptions to the octet rule. And that is mostly true of things with three electron groups. There are some structures that still can fulfill the octet rule, and we'll kind of um, get into that later. But for right now, let me just show this as an example. The semi-metals or metalloids are often kind of the exceptions to things. Now, if I have three things around a central atom, I have three electron groups, or three electron pairs, and all three of them are atoms then the way that these things spread out as much as they physically possibly can is actually a two-dimensional structure and it kind of looks like what I think is a Mercedes-Benz symbol. And so if you picture a circle around this whole thing, then the angles here would be 120 degrees, right? I've basically just trisected a circle. And I get a structure overall that looks like this. It's just a flat molecule with the uh, in this case, hydrogens coming off of each side. This is trigonal planar geometry. And so this is the geometry overall, and if I have all three of these atoms, then the name of the shape is also a trigonal plane. Now I could also have three electron groups around the central atom where I have three electron pairs total which gives me trigonal planar geometry, but only two of them are atoms, and one of them is a lone pair. And an example of this is another weird one called geranium dichloride. And the way that geranium dichloride looks is like this. Geranium's at the center, has a lone pair here on the top, and then I end up with two chlorines down here. So I still have three things around a central atom, but now I'm replacing one of my atoms with a lone pair. So now it looks like this. Okay, so I have this guy here. It's kind of hard to see with the paper in the background. This guy here. And you can see then that this kind of looks like my water molecule, right? And that's the name of this shape. It's also bent. 
So I have three electron pairs, two out of three of them are atoms, I end up with a bent structure. Okay, now there's one more option when it comes to Vesper geometries. I can also have two electron groups, and there's actually more options than this, um, but we're just going to focus at kind of an introductory level here. So if I have two electron groups around a central atom, then I only have one option. So I have two electron groups, that means that I'm going to have two atoms. And the way that these things are going to want to spread out in order to be um, as far away from each other as possible is to be a straight line, which makes sense. It gives us linear geometry. And an example of this is a pretty common molecule, um, carbon dioxide. If I take the Lewis dot structure of carbon dioxide, carbon is at the center and I have double bonds between it and my two oxygens. So regardless of the fact that these are double bonds here, I still have two electron groups. I'm connected to two atoms. Okay. So again, it doesn't matter that this is double bond. This is still one electron pair, or one electron group. And so I end up with a structure that looks like this, where we have kind of 180 degrees in between my, um, my atoms. So if I'm looking at the distance between or the angle between my oxygens, they're just in a straight line with my carbon. And this is a linear molecule, okay? So it's a straight line. And remember, the name of the game for Vesper is just that everything wants to be as spread out as possible. So if I have two things, they're gonna go on opposite ends. If I have three things, they're gonna have this kind of 120 degrees in between them. And if I have four things, then they're gonna have, uh, the angles here are actually 109. It's greater than your 90 degrees. And they're gonna try to form this kind of four-sided tetrahedral structure. So Vesper says that we're gonna share electrons in order to make a full octet and fulfill the, the octet rule but we're still gonna try to spread out and give each other as much space as possible in order to um, not group up on one side of the molecule. Um, and this includes when we have lone pairs of electrons as well. So hopefully this helps kind of going from the Lewis dot structures to the three-dimensional structures. And if you have questions on this, don't hesitate to ask. And I'll talk to you again soon.